Okay, so um, uh, I, I I think that human beings we, we've just been lucky so far in in terms of thermonuclear war. Um, uh, I don't I don't see any dawning of the age of Aquarius. I see uh, here in the United States, well, there in the United States, because I'm over the border now living in Mexico. But uh, um, in the United States, I just see a very strong polarization. And I see uh, the United States possibly leaving the era of being a republic into uh, uh, um, having that dissolve into whatever else is going to happen because half the popular, well, a, a large majority of the population, I wouldn't say half, but you don't need half. Uh, look at look at Nazi Germany. You, you needed 30% to completely change the, uh, you know, the, the configuration and the mental attitude towards the world. And uh, in America, you know, you've got the, um, you know, got one side that just doesn't, uh, is totally blind to the possibility of uh, the idea of losing and being able to handle that in a in an election is like a no longer a viable uh, option for one half, well, 30% of the, um, of the population. That can't be good. And looking at Russia, you know, I mean, Kind of like the United States, uh, you know, Russian TV has, you know, got the um, population by the balls. Uh, you know, people listen to uh, what they've been told and they, uh, a large majority of them take it as the truth. And so, you know, the we basically, as a, uh, as a herd, you know, get moved into these various directions. And the one direction we're going right now is not particularly healthy, in my opinion. I think uh, I think I'm a little bit more positive when it comes to, to these things. Um, you, I think, when you say that uh, uh, half the population is uh, uh, eating the propaganda and the state have them by the ball, mm, well, I think if if you look throughout the entirety of human history, mm, the 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 normal uh, standard way of thinking and following uh, the mores of the day and uh, being part of the establishment and uh, believing in dogma and all of that this has always been the case it it, it it's uh, what some people conspiracy wise would call to, to today at least uh, brainwashing of the people this has always been how humans live right since since we started this uh experiment of uh of modern society and super urbanization and globalization it it's it's a group thing and it's very similar to what we talked about in regards to group think among uh scientists it's the same thing uh, humans conform to uh majority and to the establishment but it also always ebbs and flows with the uh, new ideas and and revolutionary thought and uh basically toppling um the establishment when the establishment has gone too far whether that is gone too far in expansionism in inequality uh well and then of course you always have the force majeure mac uh, factors with the uh, uh, climate and uh, uh calamity and and wars right so this there's always these things happening um i know that uh, in the modern age as i said before you started recording we've been blessed with the as i said the uh the, the the very slight positive effects of the mutually assured destruction of nuclear war because people stop being uh, as interested or as uh, naturally prone to knee-jerk into horrible warfare because the <laughs> annihilation was the potential threat, right? So, so we have lived through, uh, I would say, a not peace... It, not perfect peace, but near peace in uh, at least fifty years, and that's that's fairly novel. I, I would say that before that, uh, humankind on a global uh, scale was pretty much always at war in quite a 
significant way um, in, in the majority of places on on the planet. That peace in in what is effectively what two generations is not normal. So I think we are actually moving in the other direction. I think this is because of some of the mm, new uh, development in society, especially technology wise and communication wise that people just get to know stuff so much faster sure some of it is lies lies and 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 damn lies but they do have access to to each other and to travel and communication in a way that's never been even remotely uh similar right so w i think that's why we are seeing these uh stresses uh hitting us um I think we are bound for a new period of uh, of revolutions, more likely than some sort of uh, thermonuclear war. Oh well, I, I'm I'm really hoping you're right. That's where that's the way I'd like to see it go. Um, I mean, you could, in argument in your favor, um, you look at the behavior of Adolf Hitler. Now he never invoked uh, gas warfare because why because he'd been in it he knew that you know he didn't want to wear a gas mask again uh, and I, I don't think I, I i think he knew that if he did it so would the other side you know and then that would be uh you know a, would be really wretched so neither side dare touch uh, that one um but uh, you know let's talk conventional war you know, if uh, it, you know, if uh, the uh, you know the dream of a Russian empire is an insistent uh, a part of the uh, uh, you know uh, of a the Russian government's formula for uh, a, a paradise, uh, then um, then we're we're sort of very likely to go into an ex acceleration with that where you know more and more people start to get called up uh, because hey we're going to have a conventional war and right now it's a sort of a skirmish border war uh but it, you know on the um on the one side you've got the ukrainians it kind of like you know denmark during uh, 1864 you know the um uh, the, the sort of like the calling up of increasingly larger amounts of young men uh, to serve in the army, uh, you know, and eventually, of course, the Danes got overwhelmed because they didn't have as many people as the Germans did, did the Prussians. Uh, and uh, and so, you know, it was, um, you know, it was a, a defeat. But, you know, now you've got a bigger West with sort of semi-united West against a large... Uh, um, mineral uh rich uh, uh it wants to be called an empire i think um and um you know that that worries me deeply that we uh we are seeing that kind of uh of seemingly just a minor border skirmish on a um uh, in present day and right now but it just doesn't it, it makes me feel extremely uneasy uh, and uh I think I think I think you you hit upon a, an important factor in that, which is of course a little bit uh, disturbing, the the rumblings of romanticism, right? The the looking backwards nostalgically to the good old days of the USSR or the good old days of uh, uh, American uh, exceptionalism back when they actually had it, or um, the 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 good old days when uh, uh theocracy uh ruled the uh, the region there's a lot of romanticism going on right now and it's usually uh a portent for bad things to come so i'm not necessarily disagreeing with the fact that there is things out there right now to be scared about i think the 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 reason i'm not that scared is that the difference is that today maybe you get um the propaganda uh, and the media and the establishment wanting to try and push this romantic agenda. I just don't think that it really exists in the population. I don't think it's got hold of the population in the same way that it say did in uh, during the first and the second world war. I think it's different this time. And I think it's going to prove itself to be uh, 
a lame duck. It's it's uh, the so let's just take the the USSR as the example, right? So of course you can sell this narrative of uh, the good old uh, communist uh, superpower to well, I'm I'm going to say people maybe over the age of sixty. I think you're going to be really hard pressed to sell that story to anyone else because it's just a proven fact that it was never like that and it can't ever be like that again. Um, this whole traditional way of thinking um, with nation states and, and self uh, sufficiency and uh, national expansionism and national pride. Uh, sure, uh, it 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 would have worked a hundred years ago because that was reality, but today you have youth, especially right, that are so internationally connected. Of course, of differing degrees, but the fact that young people today, I'd say globally, will have at least between 10 and 25% of their social group being remote, being actual outside their own national borders, um, usually being uh, only uh, digital friendships, social connections. And funny fact, you, you and I are uh, an example of the older generations also having these types of connections. It's just that to the younger people and the younger generations than you and I, these are much more meaningful. I'm still of the age that I remember back when uh, saying that you had a friend online or that you were uh, trying to date uh, digitally was silly. It was considered, uh, well, stupid, right? It's like You can't have uh, relationships and connections just digitally. Well, it's been proven wrong, and it always was so, right? Because go back uh, even further in history, people had uh, relationships and friendships that they maintained over long distances and with letters and, and pen pals and all these things. So it's just never been true. It's just now these connections and, and relationships are instant and way more real than they ever were before. Um I I uh, have been playing a lot of online games um, in my time, and I have connections all over the globe. And as an example, I have uh, plenty of people that I play with from Russia and from even from Ukraine. Um, and it's 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 troubling for that generation when things like this happens, right? Because they don't agree and they don't condone this behavior of course they can eventually be pushed over and be susceptible to all the othering of the the media and and start being violent but as a rule people don't want to fight and then you get into the i know it's a cliche but it's a fact as uh i believe goebbel said in uh, uh in world war ii human beings don't want to go to war you have to convince them you really have to push them into actually wanting to kill their fellow men. Really and so he succeeded quite, quite well. Yeah, uh, no, re recognizing that he he managed to push that one along. I, I see your, what you're saying in terms of the of the interconnectedness. One of the things that strikes me that's not here that was there during the Cold War is there's no ideology here. You know, it used to be all oh, those communists, you know, the, the communists is an idea we're all going to have to be, you know, like a, 1984 will all be conformed into a, in into social straitjackets. You know, well, now that that's no longer there. It's now on the Russian side. I think it's like nationalism is uh, is is strong. And th that's due to uh, 10 years uh, of um uh, you know day after day after day having a um uh, you know uh, having the media tell everybody how bad the west is whereas you know in the west i don't think that has 
you know, I don't think that, you know, they've got, they've had to justify NATO for the longest time because really they're in the, you know, after the collapse of the USSR, there really was no justification for NATO anymore. It should have been a, a dissolved at that point, but they didn't do that, you know. So, you know, here we are in a, you know, it, I, I think the run up to what we now have uh, going is the insistence. Uh, it's almost like there's, a, I can draw a parallel here between the, uh, the Aztec Empire uh, uh, keeping uh, the state of Akala um the the you know the nation state of Hakal, if you call it that the um uh unconquered because they needed that to train their men uh to war and they also needed sacrifices so they would they would keep this uh they would keep this uh continual conflict going for that very purpose and it strikes me the parallel with that is the west sort of uh you know agitating the uh, uh russia for a long time you know saying well we're not going to put weapons here we're not going to you know we're not going to threaten your borders you know and and as the time went by the united uh nato um not united uh, nato has continuously pushed and pushed and pushed and then so we ended up with uh with putin we ended up with uh, a uh, an, uh, uh, Putin seeing himself as a sort of Stalin-esque figure that he can uh, he can uh, create this uh, the, you know like a new pa paradigm, um, but of course it doesn't have idealism behind it. Now it, it's it's like going back a century to to uh, you know e empire expansionism is just absolutely insane but we hold some of that blame in, yeah, in the, yeah. the west i think i think an important aspect of, of <laughs> what you said is is basically pointing back to what i was trying to to uh, mention the othering right the diabolical uh treatment or ideological way of viewing uh your neighbors or the people that you want to victimize uh, in the case of some sort of expansionism or warfare. Um, and of course, you can then take us all the way back and say, well, one of the main factors that caused World War II was basically the mistreatment uh, in the, well, call it the the, the peace period. Uh, so the, 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 the Treaty of Versailles with, uh, with Germany basically uh, humiliated them so they were basically being othered by the the winners of world war one right so yeah. it's it's always this back and forth and and dehumanizing uh someone that is outside of your uh ethnocentric state your your national state your your ideological uh group thing but again yes we did treat russia uh in a slightly similar way and it did um infect um the ideology that we then expanded that also to uh, things like china right so so after world war ii with um uh with the yalta uh agreement right we mistreated russia uh, for ideological reasons ever since, right? Um, but we we ended up, call it appeasing or mediating that a little bit because then you get uh, mm, slightly more uh, inclusiveness with uh, the West and uh, China and, and Russia became part of the, 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 the global economy in a more free trade kind of way. And then again, of course, that led to eventually the the ideological breakup of uh, the Soviet states. Right? It it ended up basically uh, being what led to uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and basically the dissolution of uh, of the Warsaw Pact. Right? So because we 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 stopped othering them that much, we kind of mm, transitioned them into uh the global community a little bit but then recently because of of uh, uh 
economic factors and and socioeconomic uh, factors and um, all the the downsides of uh, of the modern trend pretty much what has been going on since reaganism we've got an impoverishment of our own populations right and and the reaction to that even though of course you've got increasing living standard but the relative wealth has been uh, massively decoupled right um, you pretty much uh, have been rolling back society to i keep calling it new neo feudalism because it, the difference between the top and the bottom of society today is so massive that i don't think you've seen that since like before the enlightenment it, it, it is it is almost ridiculous and what happens when you get that kind of class-based uh, decadence? It always ends up in some sort of internal revolutionary state, right? The, the, the peasants revolt. That's just the nature of, of humans. And we've been doing that for 5,000 years. So to, to then appease or shut up the peasants, the ideologues and the elites uh, need to re reawaken the the foreign beast the othering so it is because of developments in 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 the west in europe and in the us mostly in the us i'd say with the with the swing towards uh, uh extreme uh wealth inequality well what you then get is that they will say well it's it's not uh because of our policies it's because of russia it's because of china it's because of everything outside. So they pretty much paint that beast anew and give it a new uh, varnish, right, to uh, reawaken it. And because of uh, internal risk of, of pressure and revolution in places like China and, and, and Russia, they kind of agree to this because that makes it possible for them to do the same, mm -hmm. right? And say it's the it's the evil, nasty West that, that's causing all these troubles. It's not our uh, lack of modernization and lack of uh, good policies. It's it's all big bad USA, and then you basically have this uh, mutually assured uh, destruction agreement running again, and it's just not real. That's not reality. Uh, the the interconnectedness, the interdependencies, uh, the international uh relationships and 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 uh connections between actual human beings have massively escalated it it's it's just impossible today to do what you could do a hundred years ago um i, 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 <clears throat> I would um i'm i'm re i'm remembering uh, reading about <clears throat> excuse me in the first world war um before the war uh, there was a very popular book written, and I can't tell you what it is now, and it's off because it's become totally irre irrelevant except for a footnote in history. But uh, there was a very popular book said why war is impossible now because of all the interconnectedness in trade and uh, you know investments and stuff, and that that was the justification for being able to sit back and relax and say, well, you know, this isn't going to happen. The as you point out the solidification between you know there's the russians are russians and the chinese are chinese and the americans uh, who pretty much i think were quite lax for a long time at least on the surface uh, of it have now sort of a uh, are because of the own, their own internal problems are uh, pointing the uh, out the enemy you know across the border into you know other countries so we're just sort of doing a freaking repeat uh, and in terms of the internet and that connectedness I, I don't know uh, uh, Jakob I, I think you know, for instance the Chinese have done an extremely good job of isolating their population. Uh, from the rest of, of the world, with with some exceptions, but those exceptions are not enough to, uh, you know, if the uh, if their uh, authoritarian system says, you know, well, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. I, I think that um, the uh, you know the, most people will shrug and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. 
you know, I, the riots I'm, in I'm the gonna, streets. I'm going to oppose we, you. And, and uh, hang on a second. Let me finish. Well, let me finish. You know, the uh, Tiananmen Square, you know, guy with his shopping bag facing off a tank, that famous picture. You know, it's, uh, you know, there, there's the individual, you know, protesting the system. But, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I don't see it. Uh, I don't see the people coming out in the streets uh, to uh, to overthrow the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you know, at least at present. I don't see that in Russia, in China. Um, and in the United States, we know that's not going to happen because we saw two... Uh, we had two chances for uh, having a, a reformer, uh, and uh, the uh, the wealthy shut that down. Uh, so that's a that's a release valve that doesn't exist anymore. So I don't know where I you know I have no magic. I don't know where this is going, uh, and I'm just as we you and I were talking about before we switched on this thing. I'm just thinking you know how I'm going to make myself and my family survive if all this falls falls apart. Well, again, I, I'm just going to uh, oppose your uh, Chinese isolationism uh, argument because, of course, that is in effect. But isolationism uh, and uh, the the behavior like that is also quite natural, right? Um, American exceptionalism isn't born out of nothing. Like the 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 ignorance and the isolationism of Americans is voluntary. Whereas in China, it's not. The isolationism in Russia is maybe uh, more uh, about the, the, the lack of, uh, well, modernized society. But it's true in most countries. Ask your uh, fellow uh, people in, in, in Mexico, if they know what's been happening in the rest of the world, mostly they don't know what's happening. They 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 get fed a narrative that is the establishment uh, agreeing what to tell you, and the rest is completely ignored, especially all the details and especially potentially all the truth uh, underneath that. Right. Um, this is why. Well. Everyone that reads history books will uh, come out and say, well, the reasoning for uh, World War II and what was actually being fought over was uh, A, B, and C. Most people don't actually uh, read any further. They just swallow that narrative, right? Where if you then start digging a little bit deeper, you will see that there are things underneath that that's even more important. A lot of the, um, the the reasonings for wars, at least when it comes to uh, real politics and, and, and real resource uh, uh, interests, that was all about oil and the infrastructure of the system to take control of oil and energy policies, right? So who ended up winning? Well, that was pretty much the US and, and the UK, right? That's why you got the oil companies that you got. They pretty much took control of most of the oil. Uh, most of that was in uh, the Bakun oil fields and then in the Middle East, right? So mm -hmm. the uh, when we came out of, of, of the World War, that was where you got your energy and there was not that much alternative. Of course, there was still some coal, but then i don't know if it was intentionally that was kind of uh slowly dismantled right in the 70s and 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 later in the 80s so it was pretty scarce uh that people were getting their energy uh from from oil the reason i'm saying this is because if you look at who is actually saber rattling right now again it's very much the same story the difference now is that the self-sufficiency stuff that you had before World War II, where people could say, okay, we're going to hunker down and then we're going to plant uh, um, tomatoes in uh, uh, our balconies and uh, in the city parks and all that stuff, and we'll feed our population from that. That reality is gone. Today, there's seven days of food in the UK if shipping stops. Uh, the energy uh, grids are completely uh, entangling every nation state uh mostly on on the entire planet now 
maybe with the exception of, of Africa and Australia, but the rest of us are interdependent, right? The, now, the by the irony way, here, no, I was no, just going to do you know do you know what the American reliance on coal is at present? It's a uh, forty nine point three percent reliance on coal. Yeah, they, they they are a little bit behind in modernizing, but that's because of uh, a lot of uh, other history with uh, how America got their hegemony and their, their their economic power. But the point here is that the, the the irony is that if you look at most nation states in, say, Europe, because, of course, a lot of this has to do with Europe, many of them are close to, uh, call it, self-reliant. Uh, but only if you disregard the trade and interaction across the grid. Because the, the way that energy is traded in, in the European grid is pretty much every minute and every second. So even though the UK has 90% uh, of their own energy, even gas, because it's their own gas, they don't need Russian gas. The only reason that Russian <clears throat> gas is relevant is because of this uh, futures trading, the way that, that the market handles pricing of the energy resources, right? So the fact that all of these are then um, smacked together in, 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 in one uh, uh, price thing, basically what's called price elastic, all of these things are tied together, right? So whether you get your, your kilowatt hour from uh, a wind turbine, uh, a hydro plant, or a coal plant, or uh, gas, it doesn't matter. These things are tied together, even though they really shouldn't because it's apples and oranges. But they are tied together because it's, it's um, again, as I said, it's it's price elastic, uh, elasticity. And it's, it's also, this is a direct competitor, even though it's a completely different tech area and, and source, right? So because a kilowatt, uh, energy from uh, one can substitute another. They're basically to the consumer fungible. Well, that means that they are then completely price elastic and tied together. That means that they follow each other one to one. So, even though the 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 Brits can get their own gas because they have their own oil fields, the price of that gas is still going to be set by the overall productivity of the gas market. And on the gas market, on a global scale, Russia is a huge producer, right? So they have a huge part of the overall supply. That controls the price. So we are back to revisiting what happened in the 70s when uh, the Middle East, basically the, the, the oil producing countries, basically uh, decided to hike up the prices massively, which led us into all the shenanigans of uh, the energy crisis in the 70s and the resulting heating up of the Cold War. So you're basically seeing a sort of rerun of some of the same themes, and it all comes back to the same thing. This is about markets, market oversight, market regulations, and energy securities so how can we get out of this well the reason i i think we're not in a real crisis is because if you start measuring the availability of these uh, well resources nothing has changed since before the invasion of ukraine well there's the there's the disconnect of the energy feed uh, from uh, Russia to the uh, West, whereas that they're, you know, it's going more towards the uh, uh, Chinese, uh, and probably will matter. increasingly uh, uh, do so. Um, but your, because... uh, well, let me finish. Your your point's well taken. We we are still a. Um, <clears throat> the, although there are other alternative energy sources, we we are still a uh, majorly an oil coal uh, civilization uh, and of course we now know that that's unsustainable uh, i've got uh, one uh, pat particular guy in science tech nature who follows the erosion of the uh, of um, I, uh, greenland 
uh, at the moment. And he's worried about this major ice shelf shoving off, which uh, will, you know, let me go back 10 years ago. Scientists were saying, well, you know, we can expect an increase of, uh, you know, and they would measure it in in uh, centimeters uh, of uh, increase in uh, under 10, you know, under 10 centimeters. Now they're talking, you know, if this ice shelf shoves off, uh, possibly and catastrophically, he says, and this is a pretty sound guy. He's not a he's not a lunatic. He says we could expect a fairly rapid increase uh, of uh, 28 centimeters. He says, and and that is the good news. <laughs> um, well, and, and you know, I, I, with, I don't I don't really care but, about that catastrophism. Well, because... well, hang on a second. Uh, my point being is, is, you know, the oil and coal uh, system that we have is uh, eventually destroying, in large scale, our agrarian capacity because most. Uh, most of the uh, growing that occurs for our species is at sea level on flat plains. So if this happens, you know, we're looking at an entirely different world. Uh, in, but all of that, all of that is, is completely, feeding. all of that, in my opinion, is completely useless if we don't start having a proper discussion about our global economy and how it's run and governed. Because as I was trying to get to, the, the 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 problem with the current system is that because of these different sources having different pricings right so again why would you import the russian gas when you can get it from the north sea well the reason is price the reason is that they will sell it to you cheaper and it's it it gets even worse than that so not only will the influx of russian gas into europe uh, fallow the actual North Sea gas because it does. You basically turn down your production because you can just get it cheaper from the Russians. So now you're not producing locally. But it's worse than that. If the Germans uh, turn up their coal plants or their nuclear plants, they don't have those anymore, but if they turn up production on those, then they literally will pay the Danish uh, energy producers to turn off their wind turbines. So you're basically seeing a following of real productivity. This is very similar back to something we when you, you talked about uh, food production. Well, if you compare to the utilization of land, hang on a second. I need to stop that barking. <clears throat> I'll be editing that very small piece out. <laughs> well, the, the the utilization and the usage of uh, agricultural land has been dropping, right? We we uh, especially in in many uh, Western uh, countries, many of uh, of the farms are not sustainable because it's uh, cheaper to get uh, nice beef from uh, South America than produce it locally in uh, the uh, Netherlands or in Germany, right? So you get this externalization and outsourcing of a lot of of the productivity uh, of our global economy this is fundamentally a good thing but it's not a good thing if you have something like the uh, carbon dioxide uh, discussion and the cleanliness of the different energies right because it makes no sense that gas and coal can force us to fallow hydrothermic or, or uh, sorry, sorry, geothermic or, or hydro plants or uh, wind turbines. But that is what's happening because it's not as um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones thinks that everyone is always producing at their maximum capacity. If it, if it makes more sense to fallow something, they do it. You and I have lived through the, the early days of uh, the European uh, Union, right? Uh, well, back very early on, before uh, it became an actual union, when it was still mostly a trade union, well, one of uh, the things that they did with agriculture was they had these massive mountains of butter and meat and, and corn that was basically just put in big storage because if they put it on the markets, they would basically crash the prices. 
that was the beginning. But of course, everyone said this is not this is not good. This is this is horrible. You can't just throw food away to keep prices up. That's artificial scarcity. That's that does not go. That, we have to stop doing this. Then they tried to excuse it by giving it away to uh, developing nations and sending all that butter and all that meat to Africa. But still, people didn't buy it. So what did they do? Well, they solved it by then saying, okay, fine. Instead of having these uh, artificial scarcity uh, buildings, let's just do it smart. Let's just say that I will give you X amount of uh, euros per square kilometers that you fallow in agriculture. So you basically got the subsidies instead. You got <clears throat> fallowing forced by the economy to maintain a certain price. So this is this is all about how our global economy and our global productivity is operating. We are allowing things that from a proper capitalist point of view does not make sense. Artificial scarcity, planned obsolescence, all of these things should not be in existence. It, it, same as things like uh, infinite uh, uh, lasting copyrights or patents. All of these things are protectionist. It's got nothing to do with capitalism. Not even uh, uh, radical uh, uh, natural capitalism where you do see a uh, tendency towards monopoly. But this is worse. This is politically supported yeah, I mean, it's it's really tax levies are seen in an you know packaged uh, differently. Um, that want to segue for a little while to uh, of the goings on. I'm wa watching uh, the you know this unique moment in time where the uh, let us head to space for a second. I guess I'll say, uh, where the um, James Webb Telescope. Uh, its observations are sort of like we're in this moment of time where the um, the papers that are being submitted uh, have to go through uh, peer review and then publication. So we're looking at maybe January or February uh, to see what's going to happen. And it's a very interesting time because most of the peer reviewers are uh, big bang cosmologist uh, uh, supporters, and uh, they're not going to be very happy with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the data that's going to be coming out because it, it blatantly uh, suggests that the Big Bang uh, do, doesn't exist, at least not in this pre present configuration. Um, and to, re to reiterate for other people who may or may not see this uh, particular um, interview uh, discussion thing is that the um, uh, finding galaxies uh, that are fully fledged galaxies, uh, spiral galaxies, uh, most importantly, with stars that are second generation stars that take, according to present evolution or stellar evolution, take billions of years to make. To have these uh, galaxies uh, sitting uh, 200 uh, million light years from the Big Bang uh, makes it an intolerable uh, short period of time to create such galaxies. It's almost, uh, you know, the Greek. Uh, idea that uh, flies spontaneously uh, came into existence if, if there was uh, uh, you know something putrid floating around <clears throat> so, you know that abiogenesis <laughs> yeah by that's it right exactly um and um that sort of <clears throat> it's the only thing left right now for the big bang is to invoke a deity <laughs> you know maybe the catholic church will just jump on this one because you know 200 million years uh for a you know, our galaxy rotates once every 200 million years to give you some idea of the time uh, the the time structure what it would take to create uh a, a full-fledged galaxy so the big bang is dead uh, and it, the, it's the, the equivalent of forming an Earth in a year, right? 
Yes. It, 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 it's the uh, accretion of, of Earth should have happened uh, in, in a year. That's a little bit faster than most uh, people would expect. So, so yeah. yeah, that one is dead. It's something else. Exactly what they're yeah. going to end up deciding that it is. It, it's definitely not galaxies that far away that early in the universe because that is just not physically possible unless of course we completely revisit everything and start considering some of the things that we've talked about with the fact that time is not a constant uh, right right there, constant there, there, there is that but you know it's not been an issue for for the cos cosmologists up until this point but you know when you get closer and closer to the big bang you know uh if, if it's true that time is different uh, uh at that point well you know it kind of seems a little suspicious that so the galaxies that we see around here you know are the same that uh, the galaxies are uh, uh, back there uh that this the nature of of space seems to be garden variety through and through uh, at least for now uh, with the tools uh, that we have and uh, i i see the uh, my my guess is i see two things occurring with the big bang cosmologist the one that you just mentioned uh, uh Jakob, that uh, you know we'll start invoking sort of time compression uh, you know maybe they can figure somewhere going that way and the other one is moving the goalposts of the Big Bang into the event horizon fog, uh, conveniently uh, such that the JL, uh, the, the James Webb Telescope, uh, telescope can't see that far. But at that point, the um, the Big Bang theory then devolves into a hypothesis because it doesn't have the data upon to which to rest its foundation. Uh, and that is a, that is um, a kind of like a, a significant demotion uh, and, um, you know, makes it. And, and as I've said, you, that video that I put out recently is you know, the Big Bang theory is not going to die over the next, uh, you know, couple of months. Uh, well, this this is going to be. It should. I think it's important to, to, to emphasize what you just said, that it's going to go back to a hypothesis. Well, it always was. I think I think we've just been lulled into this uh, uh, dogmatic way of, of thinking and living um, because of the dissemination of science into the general populace. I think the Big Bang was always just a theory. And, and, and let's just um, uh, kind of tease with something that I know I want to talk about in a future episode. Well, Darwin's evolution is also just a theory. It's a very, very good and it was a very well established theory but it's just there's way too much uh difference between what reality is and what supports the theory and all the things that does not all the outlier data all the things that he did not cover because he did not have any tools to do so he didn't cover well he did a little bit sexual selection but then you also have the the the, the meta pressure of, of of this kind of of social selection effects. You also have things like epigenetics. You also have this um, uh, catastrophic punctuated uh, equilibrium stuff where uh, evolution kind of uh, goes out the window because it's not a steady progression of small mutations. This is a fact. Darwin's theory is part of the finished puzzle but it's only part and we've been treating it as if it's the end answer it's the same with the big bang it's the same with general relativity we keep talking about these things as if they are established and finished they're not and the whole point of of doing science the whole point of doing academics is the fact that nothing is finished and nothing is is fully covered this right, is right. Uh, th this is true in all fields. We can talk about the 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 fun history of uh, 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 of archaeology and how uh, early archaeology just started out with some nutter reading, uh, trying to read uh, the inscriptions on uh, the triumphal arcs in in Rome. Well, the, the the point I'm making is that from that to then what we do today with LIDAR and ground penetrating radar and all the things we've discovered and how we focus on 
everyday life more than big battles that are put in in lies, lies, propaganda, and lies. Right? It's completely changed the the, the picture, and this is going to continue in all of these fields. Right? So, so I don't think I, I'm not that worried about whether or not they're going going to try and hammer down and lock it because they can't. You cannot lock down lies. They will well, die eventually. It, this is I, I'm hand in glove with you on this one. You know, one of the things that we're seeing both in archaeology, in uh, in geology, uh, and especially in cosmology at the moment is, is that um, there, there's been a sort of, um, especially in in cosmology, there's been this sort of mind uh, uh, sort of trap that everything has to fit within the big bang theory uh, and if it's outside the big bang theory well then we just don't want to hear about it see that's that's what happened uh after the uh, greeks decided that the uh, earth was in the center and every, you know the sun was orbiting around it like they just didn't want to hear about it because we had this system that it me mechanically and mathematically worked why mess with it? And, and so everybody who might have come along over the dark ages into, you know, 12, 13, 14 hundreds, you know, we're just basically, you know, and, and it takes, uh, you know, the, you know, someone saying in 14 hours, you know, you know, maybe the sun is in the center, you know, uh, Copernicus with no, uh, no evidence whatsoever. Uh, but he, he, it's, it's so interesting that at that moment, it's sort of like, the the pudding was stirred and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of wise men were were sort of secretly nodding and saying you know this earth in the center thing it's kind of like it kind of sucks as you know and, and so it's sort of I think it sort of fell apart because of Copernicus, but it took Johannes Kepler and Tycho Brahe to uh, put the, the the first nails in the coffin, and then of course uh, Isaac Newton comes along and and completely nails the coffin shut. But still, for for decades afterwards, there are stalwarts that hang to the geocentric system and swear by it uh, until they eventually fade away. And, and I want to see that avoided with the Big Bang Theory and the the uh, the, the what you call the uh, groupthink guardians that well, don't allow, uh, hang on, let me finish, that don't allow new ideas to come in. Like, uh, we remember Halton Arp, uh, you know, who's looking at, at these uh, contradictions in um, in the um, red, the the uh, cosmic redshift spectrum uh, of the jets, as opposed to the central thing, and what did they do? They they shut him off from uh, uh, from more being able to do more observations. He got cut out because this wasn't in line with the Big Bang theory. So I am taking a certain delight right now, uh, uh, you know, and uh, maybe slightly vicious <laughs> delight in seeing the Big Bang like getting uh, 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 the American expression bitch slapped uh, well, across the face several times for this uh, unforgivable uh, uh, sort of... Uh, M monumental structure that was completely non-elastic and didn't allow and di didn't look at any other possibility like you know there's this guy Eric Lerner who you know who has been talking about the plasma universe the electric aspect of the universe has been completely shut out. It's all been gravi gra the gravitational mentality. And the reason we don't like the electric is because it's so damned unpredictable. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's best pushed aside so we can get on with our but black holes, which are gravitational, so that we can do all the nice things that are fit within this very comfortable realm, uh, and we can intellectualize without observational evidence. Well, as soon as the observational evidence came along, and they started looking uh, at the, uh, the supposed Big Bang, you know, it wasn't there. And uh, well, I'll let you take uh, over uh, from here, uh, Jakob, because okay, I've been uh, flapping just, my lips now for over no, five minutes. It's, it's just, I think, uh, before you, you end up in a new topic, I, I just want to point out that you are not wrong 
but you're wrong about the, the, the reasoning and the intention, because what I think is very important for people to start understanding is that there is a lot of natural human behavior in academia and science. This is not necessarily maliciously uh, done. Of course, some of it is, but it's it's really about the fact that everything is still ethnocentric, everything is still political, and everything is still economics. There is no Dr. Evil sitting in a chair like this, uh, being uh, nasty and 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 like a Bond villain uh, or like Hail Hydra. Uh, trying to control uh, the the Big Bang cosmology, or even uh, the de demolishing of uh, the idea of the electric car, but all of these things are tied into these three things, right? So, politics, economics, and human behavior, and especially human behavior, I think is important to to realize that. So. When a, an academic uh, professor has a whole range of generations of students, uh, you have this uh, terminology called a doctor father, right? Um, if I get my doctorate under a, another professor, I am basically trying to expand on um, his theories, his uh, established discoveries. So, so it's standing on the shoulder of giants and all that stuff. But it also becomes a lock-in. That means that you will end up having a school of thought that all agree on one thing. Just to mention ex an example from one of the fields that, that I've been in, uh, in theology, right? For years and years and years, uh, I think it's almost coming up on 100 years, they've been talking about the fact that there's this Q source of the Bible that is some um, artificially uh, constructed ghost uh, writing um, that the German uh, theologians uh, came up with. And this has been the standard all the way up till I'd say the last 20 years. Now people are challenging this status quo, this established science as maybe it's not that established Maybe we can stop referring to something that is kind of bunk and, and doesn't really work. And it's the same in all fields of science. It's the same in, in, in evolution. It's the same in geology. It's the same in uh, cosmology. It's the same in mathematics. And we were supposed to actually talk about that today well, because one of the things that completely upturned a lot of the, the, the stuff in, in mathematics, I'd say, is when uh, uh, Mandelbrot... Uh, uh, introduced the the nature of fractals right and how our computers were then able to actually visualize this entire field of mathematics because before that it was a bit of a fringe thing right it was these mathematical monsters that were kind of weird um things like uh, uh julia and uh, uh Cantor was playing around with some of these things, right? So Cantor did the whole thing with uh, almost itching, like breaking into thirds and, and removing. And the whole point of, of this is until there is a shift, until there is the, 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 the bravery to push back against the bulwark, right? Establishment is the way of the game. Because and that's why we're here. That's why that we have heretics... Uh, united because I mean you look at the there there's this moment in time right now where the uh the the big bang uh, proponents have a choice uh they can either uh, like uh, uh, hunker down uh, and uh, uh and basically uh give you more group think uh, than you've ever had before or it, we can break this up a little bit and uh, new ideas uh, and uh, and considerations that are based more on the observations available um, and, uh, and have a have a have a chance at breathing. This isn't going to now, as you point out. You know, this is something that's not going to happen uh, in it with any any speed. But it's not going to happen at all if the this kind of 
protest and and uh, uh, being outspoken about it doesn't happen because if that if that occurs, you know, we'll be plunged into another fifty, uh, hundred, two thousand years uh, of 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 uh, you know of just um, group group think. And just for the people watching this, I just you know we talk about group think like it's something uh, totally fictional. Um, and this is in the uh, a, a good beginning for understanding what groupthink is in uh, Wikipedia, and it breaks it it breaks it down. And you, if you point this at the uh, the the block of uh, uh, of Big Bang ism, you'll see that this fits pretty well, uh, especially people who have had who who are trying to look at things differently and just uh, as um. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, you know, first they ignore you, and that's where we're at right now. Uh, and then they laugh at you, uh, and uh, we're, not, we're not even seeing that yet. And, 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 and then they fight you, uh, and that would be great, because as Gandhi says the last one, then you lose. <laughs> or in, ca in the case of, uh, you know, new ideas, then they win. So um, I, think, I think that's I think what it's... makes this uh, this sort of discussion really, really important that we we, we talk about this now, uh, because maybe a year from now, uh, it'll all have solidified again. You know, they'll have brushed aside, you know, oh, yeah, you know, we had that little problem. We've come up with this new little tinkering, uh, and now everything's fine this is that, just, that that's the problem we we've got to face right now just just to go back to uh, a, a small thing so so i tried to point out how uh, oil economy and and energy security was a major factor of uh, what was being uh, a catalyst uh, of, of world war ii uh, it's, a, it's a very concrete example of, of there being more facts out there to study. But related to this and to the group thing, well, one of the major failings of the Soviet Union was actually tied to the fact that they got on board with the alternative theory of evolution, which was called Lamarckian evolution, right? And they did that mostly because of ideology politics and mm, well in nation state economy so it was in 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 the soviet state's interest that lamarckian evolution was fact because that meant that they could get away with doing projects in a certain way but since that theory was bunk that's not how it works there are effects that are lamarckian in in nature but on an overall perspective, Lamarckian uh, theories were wrong. Darwin was right. So that meant that millions of people starved in Russia because they decided something like this. Well, you can then say, well, what does that have to do with, 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 uh, with Big Bang? Well, every time you decide to stick with your wrong theories, because of political interest, because of ideological stuff, because of economics, because of the fact that that your little school of academics have agreed that this benefits them, well, you're going to lose out. It, it, yeah. it, it yeah. It's not always that it leads to uh, millions of people starving, but you're going to lose out. Someone else is going to get ahead. It's the same with if you insist on continuing this protectionism of oil and coal, well, you're going to be a joke 10 years from now. There's a reason why the, um, the Saudis and the Norwegians are throwing money left, right and center on everything else to make sure that they are securing their money from oil for the future. The reason is oil and gas is going to go away. I'm not saying it's going to happen within the next decade, but it is going to happen within this next century. The, the, it's going to be just as ridiculous as well burning wood or burning coal it's just not going to be viable so if you don't change if you don't shift you're going to be left behind and this is true in energy politics and energy research in uh, modes of transportation well it's going towards electric i know that that some will say well it's going to take a lot of time and there's going to be a transition yeah sure but 
the, the electric car is no longer buried. It's no longer artificially put in a on a shelf. And, and this is why all these things tie together, right? Because if our system makes it possible to do these kinds of, of uh, hiding important technologies or controlling uh, intellectual properties in these vaults of monopoly, well, that's going to influence you as a consumer. It's going to influence you in your everyday life, whether you want to consider it or think about it or not. So we could have had all this electrification 50 years ago because the technology is ancient. The fact that we married ourselves to cheap oil and coal is because it was convenient and because it was economically easy and it's and it supported certain big economic interests like the car manufacturing uh, corporations and like the US and the UK hegemony because they pretty much controlled all the oil yeah and i think as you know as you said we we had the electric car what going back now 25 years would you say 25 years yeah 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 but the yeah. Itself so, is more than 100 so right? back then we had the luxury of time we don't have that anymore. So, <clears throat> Jacob, you're quite right. <clears throat> we need to be dealing with that now. <clears throat> Excuse me. That being said, uh, you know, we've gone over an hour at this point here. Wow. Uh, I'm really sorry that Chris uh, uh, Sally couldn't uh, make it this time. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, he'll be able to do it uh, uh, next week. Uh, we'll work on that, and we're continuously uh, changing the format. Everything's open at the moment; nothing's written in stone. So um, uh, stick with us, and we're going to see where we uh, we go from here. Uh, Jakob, really enjoyed uh, talking with you today, uh, and uh, you. as usual, you enlighten me quite a bit with uh, in subjects that I really don't have that much knowledge about, and it's uh, it's uh, it's fun to be. Uh, engaged and uh, have the synapses uh, snapping. Uh, with that, I'm just going to say uh, goodbye to you all. And uh, um, Jakob and I may continue for a little while longer. Uh, but uh, so long, everybody, and thanks for being here.